Good morning. It is so great to be here this morning. You know, this is, I think, you know, I like the spring, but there is something simply magical about the fall season. You, you just, it's just magical to me. And I love, I love the fall season because you get a break from all that old summer heat and you feel that chill in the air. It's just invigorating. It's, it's just wonderful to me. So I love, love this season. And it just makes me look upon things with a different eye. And when I look out this morning and I see all of you, um, I love you this morning. Anyone told you they love you today? Well, I love you this morning. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> we honored our veterans. And I have to say a word about veterans. Uh, they are special people for what it's worth. Um, and in this day and time, you know, you, you have your right hand and you have your left hand. And you, you have some people that don't understand, and then you have those that do understand. Um, but I would like to extend a special thanks for those mothers and fathers who loan their son and daughters uh, to situations uh, that I'm sure made them afraid, made them upset. I thank wives for loaning husbands and husbands for loaning wives uh, to efforts that are sometimes hard to justify and explain but yet, there are things that exist in this world that calls for war, it seems. Um, but to our veterans and to the families that provided those veterans to us, I salute you this morning. And I thank you all over again for your service. <clears throat> well, you know what? It's my honor and my privilege to stand before you this morning. Uh, tell you a little story about how I got here. <clears throat> you know, uh, Pastor Chuck, when he left, he left us in a great situation. And he proved to me that he was more of a planner than I ever thought him to be. Because Chuck went through <clears throat> and he laid out speakers and passages and everything. So he left us a road map to follow. And that was a wonderful thing because as we started out on this journey the map found its place and it was a good place but as we traveled in time along the way things started to happen uncontrollable things like someone couldn't speak on one occasion or someone had a schedule uh, misalignment, so they couldn't speak. Well, it, it sort of happened again. Um, I'm sitting at home, and um, I got my phone there while I'm half asleep and watching some program on TV, and my phone starts to buzz me, you know, and I'm saying to myself, do I want to look at this text? <laughs> Do I want to answer this call? Well, it was a call from my cohort and my friend, Josh. And Josh, I think, was uh, having a moment because he said, man, you know, I've gone down through the list and there's nobody available. There's, you know, everybody's otherwise entertained. What are we going to do? And I was methodical about it. I took my time. It, it wasn't anything against you, Josh. I wasn't letting you stew in the oil. There was something hitting me. And that's something I know now was the Holy Spirit saying that it's time for you. This is your time, Lloyd. It's time for you to bring a word from the Lord. And I looked down in the passages and stuff, and I looked at that, and I said, yep, Lord, you have given me the most difficult passage of all. <laughs> now, what are we going to do with it? 
But from the time I entered into the word until right now, the Lord has given me a word to give you this morning. And so let us get into that word. <clears throat> We're going to come out of Mark chapter 12. And you know, we've been going down through this book. And it's a wonderful passage. It's a passage that's got some dips and turns and curves. And it's got some things that just doesn't jump off the page at you initially. But when you think about them, they sink into you. So without further ado, um, I am going to read this passage for you, and then we'll get into it. And we're going to uh, be looking at Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17 primarily, but actually it goes all the way down through uh, 28. And there's three groups of people we're going to talk about this morning. So if you will, let me read 13 through 17. And I will read parts of um, the rest of it as is needed. Uh, when they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words, when they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and don't care what anyone thinks. Nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. It is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, is the question. They're asking a question of Jesus. Is it lawful or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. As I studied through this, you know, I said, man, there isn't much here. Oh, but how wrong I was. There is a lot going on here in this short little rendition and passage. There's a lot going on. You got Pharisees, you got Herodians, and you got Jesus here. Now let's do a little character study. Now, as we know, the Pharisees, they were a religious people. They were highly religious. They were people that really camped on God's law. They camped on it. They believed in it. They practiced it to the nth degree. They dotted every I and crossed every T of the law where the law was concerned. That's one group. The other group now, of these Herodians. <laughs> Herodians, uh, they were descendants of Herod the Great. They were all about money. They were all about government. They were all about ruling. And they were all about self. And they were also a sensual people. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. But here, these two parties are coming together, and they're laying out a plan and a plot. And if you will, let's go back and look at something in Mark 3rd chapter, verse 6. And it tells you why they have decided to plot against Jesus in the first place. That's what's so wonderful about God's word. It's not short. It doesn't give you a dead end at any point in any way, form, or fashion. I 
I'll just read uh, down through six for you. It says, Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man uh, was there who had a shriveled hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. And he told the man with the shriveled hand, stand before us. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And after looking around at them with anger, he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts and told them, stretch out your hand. So the man stretched out his hand and he was restored immediately. Here it is. Immediately, the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him how they might kill him. This is why this is important. Now here you have two factions, these Pharisees, these Herodians. Actually, they hate each other. And the reason they hate each other is because one of them believes in the nth degree towards God's law, and one of them, law is not important to him at all. God's not important to him at all. And here's the reason why that exists. The Herodians were appointed by great Caesar to be tetrarchs or governors over the nation of Israel. And when we speak of Herod the Great, you have to go back and kind of look at the family heritage. These Herodians, they weren't Jews at all. Now they had such political savvy that they famed or claimed Judaism so that they could be appointed as governors and overseers. There's something kind of crunchy about that. You're not even a Jew. As a matter of fact, they were Edomites. That's what Herod was. He was from Edomite lineage. And if you remember back in the Old Testament, the Edomites, they were sort of like a den of spiders. And that's why I say they were sensual people. And if you remember, Herod beheaded John the Baptist. And if you remember the scene that is set where he calls his daughter out to do this vexing dance, this seductive dance for him. This is what you're dealing with. The Pharisees hated that. And up until this time, they had been trying to figure out how can we get rid of these Herodians? How can we get them out of power? And the other thing is, is the Pharisees hated Roman rule, but the Herodians loved it because they profited from it. They lived under it. They lived for it. Everything that Caesar wanted the Jewish people to do, he had a puppet in Herod. All that he had to do was snap his finger and Herod did the dance. If he needed to collect tax, he would collect tax. If they needed to make an example of him, Herod would dispatch his people to make examples of others. And the Pharisees spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to get rid of him. But on this particular occasion, we see that we've got two parties that are coming together to do a great evil. They want to kill a man now. And the Pharisees are right in the midst of it. You know, they're saying, let's, let's get together here so we can do something about this Jesus. 
this man, he's, he's, he's broken law. He, he's broken law right here on the Sabbath. Is that a killing offense, I ask you? In this day and time it was. They had sentenced them right there to death. So therein lies the plot. That's where it all started because Jesus decided to do good over doing something evil. He did a good work and now the plot is set against him. Now the thing about this is, is <clears throat> the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now who is the enemy? Jesus is the enemy between the Pharisees. Jesus is the enemy of the Herodians. And they have become friends. So enemy plus enemy becomes great hate. This is a hateful situation. And you know, hateful situations like this exist in our day and time. Um, I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you a little, a little snippet of, of life that I experienced. When I was in the Navy, young man aboard ship, we were headed someplace up in the North Atlantic. And I had picked out a little spot in that ship where I could go and get away from all of the card games and the shenanigans. I've always been one that covered a little bit of peace and quiet. So I found me a spot where I could have me some peace and quiet. I would go down into the engineering spaces where the emergency generators were, and there was about six feet of wall space on the one side of the ship, and then there was these huge generators. Well, I made one of those little spots back there in my quiet place. I could go back there and I could read a book or I could just think. I could just be with me. I could even go back there and take a nap. On this particular day, I was going back to take a nap. And I've stretched out my little bedroll. I've got my head on the pillow and I'm just lying there thinking. As a matter of fact, that day I was thinking about this young lady right here. I need to write her a letter. That's, that's what I was thinking. But anyway, <clears throat> I hear the door breach. And then one person comes in, two or three other people come in, two or three other people come in. There's probably five or six guys in there. They were not aware that I was in my happy place. They were casting a plot to embarrass, excoriate, humiliate another sailor on board the ship. And they laid a plot and a plan out, and I'm there now, I'm not eavesdropping. And the way I look at it, you're invading my space. What, what, what are you guys doing here? But as I read through this, I thought about that. You know, that was just pure evil. That was just pure evil for someone to plot and plan to bring someone down a notch, to make an example of someone, to do wrong or evil to someone. And so now, you know, the coin is in my hand. What am I going to do about it? I could go to our executive officer and these guys' careers might be at stake. Um, I could go tell the guy that there's a plan against him and all of this, but then he'd be upset. But you know, as it were, I recognize one voice for sure. And I went to that person and I told him, I laid their plan out to him. And I said, dude, <laughs> What are you going to do with this? I said, either you squash it, or I'll have to do what I have to do. I'm going to have to expose you. 
So the plan was squashed. And it was a good thing because otherwise this guy would have had to endure another five months of embarrassment and shame. And what these guys were plotting to do him was not a very nice thing to do to another human being at all. But it just goes to show you that people actually do this stuff. And this is real. And I know it to be real because of that experience. People plot to do harm to other people. A good thing about this, now get this. <laughs> Verse 15 said, says that, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them. Now this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus the writer is writing about what Jesus knew. Jesus knew their hypocrisy even before they laid the plan. Jesus knew that the Herodians and the Pharisees didn't care for one another. But why in the world would you come to me with a question like this? He knows that something's awry, beyond a shadow of a doubt. <clears throat> and they try to trap him, you know. They come in first and they gonna butter him up. They call him master and teacher and all of this to set the trap, hoping that he takes the bait. Just look at what they say. They brought a coin to him, and they're asking him this question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay our tax or not, Lord? If he says, no, I don't think you should pay tax to Caesar, well, they, he, the Roman government would be on Jesus as soon as he said it, because his, they would be his accusers also and said that, well, he's up against Rome. And if he said, oh yeah, you, you should definitely pay those tax and everything, well then the people that the tax is coming from, they would be against Jesus. But the thing about it is, he amazed them all. He took that very little coin, a denarius. Some people equate it to the worth of a penny, and it was a day's wage for that time. He took a denarius, and he simply says, Who, whose image? Whose image is on this coin? Who's, whose image is this? Whose inscription graces this coin? And they answer him, Caesar's. And Jesus simply answers them back, give unto Caesar <laughs> what is due Caesar. Why do you think that amazed them? He has skirted their trap. There was nothing else for them to do or say anymore. He had loosed himself right there in front of them. They had him all tied up, so they thought. So they weren't as smart as they thought they were. Here they are, trying to trick and going against the almighty God himself. And they did not. They were so deep into what they wanted and what they believed that they could not see that we're entertaining God in the flesh here. They couldn't see it. Now, question. Have you ever laid a trap for anyone? Have you ever devised a plan to get even? Well, what these words are telling me is when we waste time 
laying traps and devising evil against others. We're walking a very, very thin line ourselves because it's not so much the devisement of the trap sometimes, it's the, it's the whole process. You know, we're not supposed to let those bad things even enter our minds in the first place. And if you let them enter into your mind, you will act on them sometimes. And that's why we're to guard and be on watch all the time. Just like God watches our souls all the time. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. And it's left to us sometimes to govern ourselves and watch what we think, watch what we expose ourselves to, watch where we are going. You know, we live in a day and time, if, if you get out in the public, you should see some funny things sometimes. People in cell phones. They, you know, I, I work at Lowe's and there's a post just like this in, in, in the building. And it's usually boxes that are set around this post to keep, I guess, people from running into it. It's a good display area. But one day, all the boxes were removed. And across the store, I'm just, for some reason, I'm watching this individual and they got their cell phone out, right? And man, they're just a tapping and, and walking. And I mean, this person smacks the steel pole, just whole body kiss. <laughs> you know, I, I mean smacks it. And it's because we're so inattentive. You know, we've been given eyesight, a sense of smell. We've been given these instruments to hear with, and we don't use them properly. Um, you've been given one mouth, but you've been given two ears. That tells me that per ratio, you've got two to one. So listen twice as much and speak very little. That's a good rule. Now you got eyes, and your eyes they see a, a great pattern, but some of us go through life with a focus here when our focus sh should be here. Just plain and simple. But it's important, people, not to dwell with hate, not to deal with hate. You have these two factions who have come together just they have so much hate and guile for one man, they plot against him, they plot to kill him. And it's just, there's no good in that. And we are warned time and time again throughout the annals of this book about our relationship with hate. And that's what this is about. It's not about a coin. It's not simply about a juicy little story about a plot and how the plot was for it. I think these words are printed here to make us think about what is the underlying problem here. The underlying problem here is hate people. And you know we've got a lot of hate in this world right here and right now. And so I'm here to encourage you this morning to take stock of what we are hating. It starts as a seed within us, and sometimes it grows into a mighty, mighty tree on our exterior when it blossoms. And it's too big for us to control, and hate is a dangerous thing to play with. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing to play with. So don't get caught up as the Pharisees and Herodians. Let's not be guilty of plotting against 
any man. But Christ calls us to love and to love deeply. He calls us into a unity which only heaven knows. And I believe that we can achieve that unity if we would not hate so much. So be careful. Be careful about what you think you hate. Now let us pray. Father God, your word never goes out void. Lord, sometimes your word is simple. And sometimes, Father God, the simplest of words are hard to digest. And we all, Father, fall into the realm of, I don't like this, I hate that. Father, will you make us mindful of what we say and how we feel? We're supposed to be slaying ourselves. We're supposed to be broken vessels, Lord, the vessels uh, that only you can put together and use again. And if we're harboring hate for one another or hate for anything in our hearts, Lord, there's no room in there for you. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Herodian, Lord. Have mercy, Father God. Have mercy on us. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.